Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jawe Han from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And uh, I want to thank Dong, who is really the host who has acted, but he very kindly you know, asked me to sort of introduce Professor Han, so I'm doing that. Um, so Professor Jawe Han, almost all of you probably know, He's been really prolific in the area of you know data mining, data warehousing, with he has like over 400 publications in major you know, major conferences and journals. Um, he was awarded the highest honor of the SCM Seek KDD, which is the special interest group on knowledge and data mining. He got the KDD Innovations Award, um, which is the highest recognition in this subfield. In addition, uh, he is a founding um, editor of the ACM Transactions and Knowledge Discovery. Um, again, that he really made happen and it has really flourished since then. He has a book, Data Mining, Concepts and Techniques, that has been used as a textbook worldwide. He has been in numerous program committees, has been the PC chair for KDD, SDM, the, and also the ICDM conference, all major data mining conferences. And as you can see, his work is so well regarded that all, you know, in the sponsors list, you can almost you know, see everyone that could have possibly sponsored. That sort of speaks to his uh, being a very prolific contributor thank you. in the technology. Thank you. So welcome and thank you very okay. much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks uh, to Suhaji for the nice introduction. Yeah, uh, it is my pleasure to visit Microsoft Research. I think uh, that's for quite a few years I've been <laughs> not really come to Microsoft Research. I've been busy working on many things. So today I'm going to discuss more uh, mining knowledge from database. Especially here we have a very strong database group. Uh, I was thinking about you know, linking data mining with databases uh, using a new method called information network analysis approach. Uh, the work actually has been done together with uh, several of my PhD students. Actually Xiao Xin is now a Microsoft Research uh, member right sitting here. So, and the two other students are the newer ones and still under the PhD program. Okay, so for uh, about database and information networks, people are originally thinking these are two very different things. Uh, databases, people are doing transaction management, doing query processing, storage, and all these things. And information networks, people are more thinking about like social networks, Twitters or you know Facebook. Actually, if you really think about these two things, there are some inherent links, which actually is very interesting. So the first thing is about this uh, traditional view of database. Most people are thinking database is a data repository, and database system usually doing like a transaction management, uh, data retrieval, querying, updates, you know, indexing all these different games. But on the other hand, if we have another view, for example, from a data miner's view, you probably say database actually is organized information networks. Okay, why? Because not only data themselves, they have structured records, but they also link to different things. We know, for example, you have joins, you link to the other things. Even you do not really do joins, they inherently, they link together. Okay. So to that extent, we are thinking the database actually is information rich, interrelated data relation. And they form really, really huge okay, information network. Another interesting thing different from other information network is it is interconnected, it is multiple typed. To some extent, you can say this is a well structured information network comparing to some other networks they are not so structured. Okay. Then I'm going to show you, if I say this one is DB Infonet, it's database Infonet, we actually can derive surprisingly rich knowledge from the database information networks. And you are going to see it. So that means if we want to uncover or discover knowledge from the database, 
we better view this one as a network, then we do link exploration, link analysis. Then you probably see there is something amazing we can get out. Okay. So uh, instead of showing you something very abstract, I just show you a very concrete database probably everybody understands is DBRP. Okay. Unfortunately, this DBRP is only one huge database instead of a, you get a complicated entity relationship, data model, link, many, many different relations together. That one, currently I do not have a very concrete example to show you. But I just show you this one DBRP data. If we know this one is not too small, you get a millions of records. You get uh, almost half a million authors, and you get a thousands or uh, tens of thousands of conferences. Okay, with this, we link together what things may happen. Okay. You probably want to say, can I derive some interesting knowledge from this database? Okay. For example, you may say, what are the popular or growing research fears or sub fears in computer science? Or you want to say, who are the leading researchers on database or just on X queries or something? Or you say, whether the different sub fears, whether the author collaborate, evolve, and all these things. Or you even want to know, for example, we found there, uh, Xiaoxing did it, how many Wei Wangs, just the same name. <laughs> okay, and which paper belongs to which Wei Wangs or something. Or you, you just say, even Search Brand did not get a PhD, who, were his, uh, who was his supervisor? Okay. So, or you want to know uh, who are very similar to Christos Valusos. Okay. Those are the very simple or very typical question. The problem is, whether you just take the BRP, whether we can mine it, or we can answer those strange queries or something. So this actually, we're, I'm going to show you all these questions actually can be answered readily and also can be answered efficiently in this network. Okay. So you will see something pretty interesting. So the first thing I probably will just give you a link. What is information network? You probably heard a lot of social networks like Twitters or you know, Facebook, all these things. But on the other hand, if we look at the information network, we can say this is somewhat more general than social network. Why? Because social networks just link people with people. Okay? But information network link objects with other objects. But objects could be people as well. So that's why the social network is just part of the big information networks. Okay. For example, you think about DBRP. Not only you link with your co-authors, but actually you link with the conferences with different keywords, you know, like different sub -fears. So it is richer than just the people linking with people. Okay. Then actually people already study lots of networks, but we try to categorize the network into two different categories. One we call homogeneous network, another we call heterogeneous network. A homogeneous network means when you link things, you link the same type. Okay. Just thinking about it, you got Facebook, you say I link with my friends, and friends link with friends, those are homogeneous ones. Even you think about a page rank, okay. people say web page link to the other web page, endorse the other web pages. These are page link with pages, this is still homogeneous. But what a heterogeneous one? You were thinking about multiple types. This is exactly like a database. You think, oh, this entity linked with the other entities. Okay. That forms heterogeneous, multi-typed network. Just to give you a simple example, like a medical network, you have patients, doctors, disease, contacts, treatment, all these things. Remember, both doctors and patients are human. Okay. But on the other hand, they play very different roles. Patient linked with patient, and patient with link with doctor, doc link with doctor is very different. Okay. So the same thing as a bibliographic network, like a DBRP, you get a publications, authors, venues, terms, all these are linked together. Okay. So those are heterogeneous information networks. Okay. Then if you look at a web scale, everybody knows this is very important. You get a web is big network, or protein, get a protein networks, bio networks, co-author get networks. Here I do not even show networks, I just say social network sites because there are so many. Okay. But you know you got a, like a Facebook or something, they claim they have 100 million, you know, even this number now I was told is 300 million. Okay. But anyway, it is a very big thing. 
But if we categorize network in two kinds, for example, co-author network in DBRP, you would say this is more like homogeneous one. But you get a conference and author linkage network, this one is heterogeneous one, even just two types. Okay. Now, if we want to mine this network, okay, the first interesting thing is we were thinking about a clustering and ranking of heterogeneous information network. So you may say, why we want a clustering and a ranking? Actually, this clustering and ranking regularly practice in any network. You just think about this. Okay. The first thing is, before even like a Google came, okay, most people, you meet other people and say, give me URL. Okay, why give me URL? Because otherwise you may not even be able to find this researcher. Okay. Uh, you have to go through, you know, like a Stanford University, go to computer science department, you know, you would know those gopher or something, you know, you go down, you know, it's a painful. Okay. That's the reason people start building links. I use my web page link to a lot of database researchers because I don't want to keep crawling. But with Google, why Google is interesting? It's ranking. Okay. If you say you, you get a name, say, you know, Jeff Arman, okay. Then you, if you say, oh, 10,000 pages found, you will have no time. You know, if they are not ranked, you probably will abandon this. Okay. But if they are ranked, you find a home page right on the top. Then that's nice. So that's why ranking becomes critical for any network. Okay. The clustering is also very important because you, you, you cannot find clusters. You, you got a, the network like a millions of nodes. How could you search? How could you comprehend? But the problem most people are thinking is ranking and clustering are two things. Okay. But actually, ranking and clustering really should work together. You're thinking about this. I say, rank all the people in academia. Okay. You would say, oh, is it computer science or physics? Okay. Even you get computer science, you say, is database or data mining or AI? Okay. So you know you have to make sense instead of comparing chicken with ducks. You're just comparing within the peers themselves. So that's why you need clustering and also you need ranking. I actually will show you, for example, you mix database and architecture together, you try to rank them, you will get garbage. Okay, just these two. Okay. So that's the reason we say we need to do both, but people usually think they can first do clustering, then do ranking, or first do ranking, then do clustering. Actually, we we're going to show you. If you do clustering and ranking these two processes together, integrate them together, you get much better clustering and much better ranking and much more efficient processing as well. Okay. So you will see that's something pretty interesting. Uh, the paper actually published last year in EDBT, uh, E. Jo Sen. Uh, her paper actually, we were thinking is very novel in the sense you're really getting two things together, you get better on both sides and are more efficient on both sides. So at first, you just mingle this database, data mining with data hardware and computer architecture. These two communities together, merge them in DBRP. See what I will get. Okay. You, this left side is what I got. What I got here actually is, I look at this to my surprise. Okay. I even, the first top five, I cannot find sigma of VRDB. Okay. <laughs> you actually can see the sigma of VRDB are in the total 20 conferences. You know, the top ranked one VRDB Sigma ICD was number eight to 10 or something. That's pretty dismal. And if you look at the researchers, even, even more you know, disappointing because I barely recognize anyone except I know Jason Kong, not because he's a database person, just because he was a, a, a UCLA department head and also graduate from UIC. That's why I know him, otherwise I won't know. Actually, if you really partition them, okay, you do cluster, then you do ranking, you can see this is the ranking in one of our parameters or system, you get a VRDB sigma like this. Okay. I, I will tell you why VRDB on top than sigma. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, these are the researchers uh, I, we in one of our running, you know, getting this. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this query ranking, uh, later I'll show you. This is just to say we do clustering. For each cluster, we get top ranked list. Sorry. Actually, you can rank user, them pretty long. You do not need to enter any query. Uh, user, basically, you can enter something like a clustering computer science or clustering ranking computer science, S somewhat like that. Okay. 
So if you think about it, this whole process, we just take this RAN class, the DBLP network, okay, but we take a shorter or simplified version, it's only two things. This part is conference. Okay, I show you is database, data money, and AI conferences. Okay. And here is this, just a bunch of researchers. They link in different ways. Okay. What you can see is for this kind of a study, you don't even want to do natural language processing. Okay. These are just links. This is like a Google game. You just get links, you just link them together, okay. then you analyze them. Okay. What do you do? You can do ranking using some kind of ranking rules. I'm going to show you what are the ranking rules, but you use ranking, you get different things. Okay. Then based on this, you, in, the, in the middle of the loop, okay, the first ranking may not be even good. Okay. You go to clustering. Then you go back to ranking, clustering, turn this one again. After a few rounds, okay, you will find it's amazingly good clustering and ranking on both. So you may say, why I have to do that? You, you say, if I were you, I would first do clustering. Okay. Uh, because I know database is a cluster, you know, AI is another cluster, why bother to do ranking? Okay. There's one intuition you probably will be convinced. Okay. Suppose you got one, you know, I got one PhD student trying to do database. Okay. Maybe submit to some kind of workshop, get a paper on DBRP. And here we have Sui Chaudhary, got a, Tons of papers and uh, very influential. Okay, when I rank this two, when I get this clustering, does these two people will weight exactly the same when I clustering database cluster? Probably not. Okay, why I guess each other with so many years, so many publications, influential with a first year PhD student got one paper there in a workshop. They are different. Okay, so if we want to do meaningful, get a good clustering, you have to think. Not everyone is equal, okay? So if we think about this, what about give a little more weight to the highly ranked guys? So you get a better cluster or you get a worse cluster? Likely, even semantically, you'll get a better cluster. So that's why motivation, we want to do that, okay? So this rank class philosophy, starting not treating every node equal, okay? That's a changing of the game, but it's a, it's a nice change of the game, okay? So now you can see why we want to rank in clusters together. The first thing is we say they can be mutually enhanced, mutually improved. Okay. The ranking, if you can do cluster, the ranking become more accurate. But if you can do you know, both things, you know, the very interesting thing is we said not every body, not every object should be treated equally in clustering. Actually, that's the different game of clustering. But why the other people don't think about this way? Right? They treat every object just the same as how the clustering game is doing this. But it should not. Okay. So with the network, you actually will treat something, you think they are different, they are very close. For example, you think of VRDB and Sigma. They are different. If you do natural language processing, you will say, they're you know, at a distance, actually three far away. Okay. But on the other hand, we know they are so close. So that's the reason you think they are different, maybe they are the same. You think they are the same, they are different. Okay? So the game should be changed. Now we look at this algorithm. The algorithm we work out, if you think about this, is pretty simple. Okay? Initialization, we don't have knowledge. We can randomly partition anything. Okay? But with random partitioning anything into K clusters, suppose you say I want a whole computer science partitioning into 20 clusters. You can do that randomly. Okay. Then what you do for ranking is you can kick in some kind of ranking rules. I'm going to show you what are the ranking rules immediately. Yes? The input is just some graph or are there any other? Yeah, these are, when you cluster them, the nodes, you first don't even consider the graph, just to say nodes are separated. Okay. Of course, once it's separated, the network could be separated. But you don't care that much about it, whether it's min cards or max cards. You don't care, okay? Because this is very rough. So the input okay. is just a graph? And just a graph. You just take nodes. You just put them in randomly into different clusters. That's it. Okay, it's very simple. Yes. What is the objective function? Uh, the object function, later you'll get this. Okay. 
So the ranking actually will do, you know, like you take some ranking rules. Later I'm going to show you. Everybody, if you want different thing, you can get different ranking rules. Okay. Then you can generate new measure space based on this. You say, oh, this one, actually in this cluster could be maximized or somehow you get, a, get some function. Then you can adjust your cluster. Okay. Once you adjust the cluster, you repeat step one, you rank again, you generate measure space again, adjust again. Okay, turn this into loop. If you know k-means, you know em, this is a similar game. Except you put the ranking in the middle. Okay. Now, in the real network, of course, all the network most people want to play is a matrix. Okay, you're just thinking, you get a matrix of conferences and authors and conference and authors. Okay. So if you take a conference as x, uh, authors y, this is Author publishing the conference, Com conference takes the authors, and this is author link with authors by initially just co authors. And here, conference link conference initially is empty. Okay? Even sigma and VRDB are not linked. Okay? So then, after a few rounds, you will see who and who will be linked together closer. Okay? So now we get into this ranking. Okay? Uh, and we test the two ranking strategies. One we call simple ranking, another we call authority ranking. Okay. What is simple ranking? Simple ranking is very easy. You just uh, take those links. Okay. You get more links, you get more ranks. Okay. Just thinking, you publish more papers, okay, you rank higher. Okay. Or you, the conference took more papers, the conference could rank high. Okay. But that may not be quite right. Thinking about this, if, if some guy got a paper all rejected, so they say, oh, set up our own workshop. We publish 20 papers in this web workshop or conference, that's it. Okay. Maybe it will be indexed by DBRP. But remember, there's one golden rule. Okay. The golden rule we can do for this authority checking is you have to restrict, you say, whether the author could be ranked is not only you publish papers, you publish in highly ranked conferences, like Sigma, VRDB, those conferences. You publish in a junkie, some yourself workshop, it doesn't count. Okay, but how could you know which conference is highly ranked? We don't want anybody to train it. Okay, what we do is we say highly ranked conferences attract many papers from many highly ranked authors. Okay, there are double many. Okay, not only taking more papers, you will be hero. You have to take more papers for many highly ranked authors. If you set up a bogus conference, I bet you know people here will not even join. Okay, so that's the reason the highly ranked authors. Actually, the, the highly ranked authors, many will dictate this highly ranked conferences. Okay. And also, we actually say the rank of author is enhanced if you co-author with some highly ranked authors. Okay. That one will distinguish, for example, you get into like a Stanford University with a university or community college. The reason is you can publish paper, but you publish in Stanford, you co-author with some big name guys, probably get more credit than you publish one paper in a, uh, by a community college with no namers. Okay. So if we know this is a rule, we can encode this rule in our matrix form. Okay. Uh, actually, this is rule one, we encode it in this way, rule two, and rule three. Okay. Rule three, because the people disagree each other on collaboration, how much weight it can get. So we put the alpha as a parameter. You can slide in the bar and say, I like collaboration or hate collaboration. Whatever, you can slide it you get different weights. Okay. So then we play the game just to go back to this 20 conference mingle with database and the hardware. Now you see with this rank class we put in the middle, you will see one line, the green line is the hardware one, and the red line is database and data mining one. You will see the space after certain iterations, they are well separated on the ranking. You can see the highly ranked guys here will be very low ranked here. Okay. The same thing, highly ranked here will be very, very low ranked here. Okay. So they are se very separate community. Of course, I take this two community, not take database and data mining as one because it's a little harder okay, to, to, to partition them. Then we get into our step two is generate new measure space using mixed model. Okay. This is a little statistic uh, game. Basically, it's you just use it using those uh, you know, conditional probability, you get this model, you think they are generating model, 
then you finally can get some kind of maximizing the log likelihood. But I'm not going to get into very detail, you know, just a very typical traditional statistic game you can get it. Okay. Then you actually can see after two or three iterations, this two, you know, cluster, not only ranking are separated, the cluster were separated. This is database cluster, data mining cluster, this hardware computer architecture cluster. They are far apart. Okay. So now you get into after this, you do cluster adjusting. Okay. The adjusting basically, remember, we do this clustering essentially it's like an EM algorithm. This is not a K means. So you got is a soft clustering. So called soft is, you can say, oh, you belong to the database is 0.83% or something like that. But you belong to the others, or maybe 0 0.05 or 0 0.05 is, you know, it's a different thing. So it's not like 100% A, 100% B. Okay. Then you see this. This is initially. Okay. Initially, you'll probably see it be, because it's random, okay, so somehow the two things actually mixed up. I, even when we do initial, we're actually getting, like you add up a little. So the ranking, if you got a natural get more papers, you get a little higher ranking. So it's not a completed random here. But uh, the, you look at the cluster, they really mingle together. Okay. But then you, after you do one iteration, two iterations, three iterations, they become stable. You see they are very separate. Okay, so it's very small number of iteration. You actually can get it done. Complexity. Okay, people say network usually is very complicated. You have to do use cloud computing. You know, like you know, very powerful things to do, to do this. In many cases, like in Google, definitely you need it. But here we play a different game. Why? Even we get this DBRP network. The game is different from SimRank. You probably heard SimRank was done by Jennifer Williams group in Stanford University. They, they rank and cluster networks. Uh, mostly, you know, what they do is they calculate every two nodes in there, they calculate their similarity. Think every two nodes, okay, how many nodes you have? You have n nodes, every two you get n square pairs. And they are not only compute, directly compute this, they are computing your first neighbor, then your neighbor's neighbor, your neighbor's neighbor. Okay, that's the complexity. You have the pair. You get a quadratic number of these pairs, and each pair you compute the links and links and links. Okay, you can hardly optimize it better because thinking of quadratic plus those links, the complexity is there. Okay. For us, why we got a linear algorithm? Okay. The reason is every time when you evaluate, you evaluate number, your, your distance to the center of the cluster. How many centers? If you say I want to get 20 clusters, you have 20 centers. 20 is a constant. You get a million people, a million papers, you get only 20 centers. Okay. So that's why this K, you said K is 10, K is 20, K is nothing. Okay. That's the reason you go to the linear number of edges. Remember, everybody publish limited number of papers. Okay, you don't publish in every conference, every thing. So probably a maximum is 400 or 500, okay? So this, this, even you say on average, E versus N is 500, you still have a constant. That's why it's constant number of nodes, okay? So this is a linear algorithm, it's very efficient, okay? Then, if you do case study, this one we just uh, run this uh, set k equals 15. Okay, and uh, because we don't have 15 columns, it's too too narrow. So we only show five. This is database com networking, AI theory, IR. For example, you look at theory. Remember, this this uh, guy knows nothing about a field, but they put a soda, stock, fox. Probably those theory people know these are the top three things. Okay, and a database actually. You may argue why VRDB uh, ICD actually is a little higher than Sigma. Remember, nowadays VRDB and the ICD actually share many, many co you know, common authors with Sigma. Okay, their ranking, they do take a lot of reputed authors. On the other hand, they take more papers. Sigma usually takes 70 to 100, and VRDB take 100 more plus papers. So you get more papers, actually you get more reputation if they have the same authors. Okay, so that's the reason actually it's hard to judge. Remember, we don't have citation count. If you have citation count, 
in DBLP, it will be a different game. Okay. But anyway, then you say you can only do two byte-type network. Then we got another paper. Actually, this one in the last year, KDD 2009. We say we're not confined to byte type because type, byte type is too simple. For example, within database, you want to say who are the top researchers on XML or on transaction management or on query processing. Okay. So if you want to know that, they publish in the same conference. You just cannot distinguish them. So we need what? We need terms. Okay. You said, oh, this is transaction management. No, this is a query optimization. Okay. You got different terms. Only you introduce term, this value and author will really make sense, right? You can further partition them, okay? So that's the reason we say we need a more typed network. You have a research paper linking with this. This is from, if you are familiar with data warehouse, this is more like a star network, okay? That's why we call this one a star net schema. You look at, we call it star network schema. It's not star schema because otherwise you, 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 you confuse with the OLAP people, okay? But we got this. Remember, there are many, many operations that actually follow this star network. Okay. Then what we are going to do clustering and ranking is we break this thing. We think this thing is a type to thing. This, you get all these small ones. We call this a small type. Once you break them apart, you are not breaking authors as author, conference as conference. You actually, even you break them into tiny nodes, they still keep these star structures. Okay. The bigger star get into small stars, you get star form hierarchies. Okay. So, and every this star you may have ranking, you may have clustering. Okay. For example, you can get a hardware cluster, database cluster, theory cluster. Okay. You can get this. So what we call the star network schema is you get a center node, which is more like in data warehouse, you have the star as a center. Okay. Then you take all the attributes or different other nodes, you put them aside, you form a star network. Okay. And with the star network, we can study, uh, for example, I can give you an example. This is DBRP. You, you have these this different things. Okay. This is delicious. Delicious, you also can get this. If, for example, you can say this is tagging event. The tagging event, you may have users, and you have websites, you have tags. Okay, so you actually can get this network. This is IMDB. It's about you know the movie database. So you get a movie as a center, and here you have director. Here you have an actor or actress, and here you have title and plot. So you also can form star network. Star network almost can be anywhere. Okay. Then I just show you. I won't give you the detail because we have lots of things to do. So I just show you this one. Essentially, the general principle is very similar to rank class, but you're working a little more complicated network. Okay. But you, you probably can see the running. We, we, took this count, we took this four fears, database, data mining, machine learning, information retrieval, because this four fears nowadays is all intermingled together. We want to do clustering, and we want to do ranking. I will show you one minor, small cluster, what you will get. Okay. Here you can see. Uh, suppose we look at a cluster one part is KDD, you see how different iteration they go. Okay. You look at the KDD, the zero iteration, you get a database, data mining, machine learning, uh, and uh, some, this BC is others. You look at this, okay. at the very beginning, it's almost evenly distributed because it's randomly partitioned. Okay. But after a while, after a certain iteration, okay, like 10th iteration and, uh, and also the, the stable iteration, you got, once you get stable, you see this is 0 0.92. KDD belongs to data mining. Okay. But it, of course, you may also, KDD may belong a little towards IR, a little towards machine learning, a little towards database. Okay. But it, 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 obviously, you get the uh, idea. Uh, what about Mike Stonebreaker? Okay. Mike Stonebreaker actually is 90%, uh, let me see. 95% belongs to database. He's a very dedicated database person. He barely go to like a data mining or machine learning. So that's why 0.0%. 0, 0%, yes? I think I understand the result there. Uh, so in your input, each part of the paper has a column that classifies the paper as a data mining paper? No. The database, each paper, remember in DBRP record, you have a conference, you have this paper ID. 
This paper ID were one way where you have the information about authors. Another piece of information is about title. Okay, that's the only information you have. You don't have abstract, don't have links. Okay, but then you have conference information, like a Sigma or VRDB. So how did you add on, on the concept data mining or the concept databases? Is it one of the clusters in your output or? Oh, okay. Yeah. Actually, this one, that's a good question. Actually, this question is we first do clustering. Once you do clustering, you actually get a database cluster, data mining cluster. How do you get it later, you'll, you'll see. We, even you use robot, you can get it. You don't need a human to intervene. Okay. Of course, we did intervene. We put a label, say, this is database, this is data mining. Okay. But you, later, you'll see how I claim the robot can do it. Okay. But you don't, of course, don't get the labels. Yeah, you don't get labels, but you use just top two or three keywords. You mark it, you get it. Okay. So you, you will see, it's very interesting. You, you, you will see this database. For example, information retrieval, you see the top information retrieval cluster. The top word, one is information, one is retrieval. Okay. And then, of course, you grab this top. Like XML, you get one is XML, one is X query. Uh, of course, there are other queries or something, optimizations, other keywords. But you grab two, you say XML, X query, you actually get a cluster name. Okay. So uh, the same thing, you can see this. Okay. Yeah, this one I actually show you uh, how things you, the machine is running, what you will see. Okay. When we do the, all the four fears doing clustering, what do you see? Finally, after a few rounds, you get stable. You get stable, these are all numbers but you can either see what's the numbers. For example, triple AI. Triple AI belongs to the third column, and CVPR belongs to the third column, ECML third column, ICML third column, each chi third column. What the column is about? AI, right? You, you know this is AI. And the first column, EDBT, ICDE, I, uh, the first column, let me see. Pods. Uh, Sigma, VRDB, what's the, what's the first column? Database. So that's very, you, you, you just look at the top one. But there's one outlier, you press CI, we don't mark any one red. CIKM. CIKM actually is a, is a mingled with quite a few things. You look at this, we don't know, this one actually is IR. Okay. This one is database. Uh, this is database, this is data mining. So they have more IRs, more somewhat data mining, then they have a little database, a tiny little machine learning or AI or something. So you know this is a little intermingled mixed conference. We do not know even which field it is. But anyway, actually IR people claim this is the second IR conference or something like that. That's probably they do have some, some arguments because the highest one is IR. Let's just look at database cluster because we have many database people here. You probably see what you see, why I claim you, you can get a label automatically, the top keywords, database, databases, system, data, query, system, queries, management, object, relational, those are databases, right? That's all the game database is playing. And these are the conferences, and these are the rank, I cannot say rank authors, but they are very dedicated database and very productive, okay? So these are the like Switch, Ottery, Mike Stonebreaker, Mike Carey. You, you know a lot of names. I think uh, almost every poor is here. David Lume is here. So everybody is here, right? So that's a database, okay? And we actually can go deeper to do subcluster. You can see this is a subcluster of XML X query. Who are the concentrated ones? Search Abitbor, Victor Viani, you no know, Jerome, Mike Carey. No, you probably also know these names. They play a lot of games on X query, X databases, uh, XML. Not only that, you actually can, can do the same game on other databases like Flickr, okay? Flickr, you, you type a Raleigh, what you will get? Okay, we don't know, but Raleigh, when the people got it, actually there are several clusters. You can see there are three clusters. This cluster likely will be Raleigh, North Carolina, is capital, right? And this Raleigh are all Raleigh bikes. It's a famous bike, everybody knows, okay? And this Raleigh, I really do not know, but I know this one is an actress or some singer or somebody. I'm not a, a fan of the singers, but at least there's something related to other Raleigh's. Okay. They automatically, they can do, remember there's no human being, no pattern recognition involved. Okay. We do zero image processing. 
but we actually can get something pretty nice based on tags, of course. So you probably can see this is a pretty general framework. We actually did it on you know, IMDB, on a Delicious, on Flickr, and many things using the same game. Okay. So it's a very interesting. Okay. So we work out a system. Actually, the system called INEX cube. Why we call it INEX? I is information. Now it's everything's I. Okay. INEX cube. <laughs> Now, INEX actually is the information next uh, network enhanced text cube. Okay, so we have the cube, we have text, we have information network, everything put together. Okay, so what you see here, like uh, we did a VRDB demo. You actually, if you have a computer here, you can just uh, type, you know, like uh, yesterday in Bing, I just asked them to type uh, Bing, you know, like uh, INEX cube. They actually can play with this right, right on spot. And these are different things actually. I remember last uh, December, Hector Garcia Melina actually came to UIC. He asked me what's new. I said, oh, we got a system pretty interesting. Uh, I told him, he said, oh, you cannot fool me. I was the department head of Stanford. Uh, I do all the evaluation on all the fears. He typed graphics, he looked at the names, and he typed uh, theory, he looked at the names. He said, oh, this system is pretty trustable. I said, why? He said, oh, the Stanford professor are on the top. <laughs> <laughs> so that, then we probably say, this one has no training. Okay. Now we look at, what about I add training inside? I, a lot of people want the training. You know, want to say, I want to twist it. I don't like your, your, your ones. So that means you, want, you say, I do have prior knowledge. I want to put in. Okay, I want to do training. So the input is not only this network, but I give you a bunch of class labels. Can you do better, or can you do worse, or can you really do it? Okay. Of course, it will be a different game. The previous game was, uh, was a clustering game, now it's a classification game. Okay. So what we can see is this. Okay. Now the game becomes a little uh, interesting. For example, if you want to say, what emails likely could be involved terrorist? Okay, suppose you want to get this. So you may put some suspicious users or words or emails as a training set. You put it down there. Then with this one, you, you do the network analysis. You may be able to analyze which email likely will involve some terrorist activities. The same thing, like we actually work with the U.S. Army Research Lab. They give us like $16 million. Uh, of course, it's a big center in quite a few universities. And we do information network analysis. You may be able to, to classify which things is related to military camps. Okay. Now, the general philosophy is this kind of picture. Okay. You, got, you, you mark some class, say this one is state mining. Okay. Suppose this one is your knowledge. Then you can propagate from the conference down to papers, uh, and you can propagate it down to authors. And uh, this propagation may help you actually to classify databases. Okay. So that interesting thing is the class labor you got. Sometimes you think it's funny. You give a uh, labor to the conference. Actually, to get a very high performance on the authors and on the keywords because they are linked. Okay. Link things can propagate. Okay. That's what we call knowledge propagation. So we work on new paper or new, new software called GNetMine. Okay. G is a graph. Actually, it's a, it's a graph regularization is underneath. So we use, that's a network mining. Okay, you can think of it this way. And the general philosophy is you use a graph-based regularization network. The regularization basically is some kind of smooth, you can think of, you do some kind of boosting or something, you do some kind of smoothing, you get a better classification accuracy. Okay. So the general idea is you use consistency, some assumption, you do this, this maximization, some kind of propagation. Based on the class labor, you can, you can propagate down to the other parts. Okay. I probably will not give you this uh, uh, mass formula to the explanation. You just know this is some kind of mass formula. You actually can get uh, normalization terms. Then you get uh, this, like a, some kind of estimation on the maximum likelihood. Then you finally can do you know, this game. Okay. The student who work on that, actually she got a very good training on that. 
uh, originally when she did an undergrad study. So what we still do is we take these four areas, okay, database, data mining, AI, information retrieval. So we got, uh, you know, these uh, ten thousands of papers and authors, and we actually get these three things. We do different kinds of training, okay. Now we actually compare with a few quite rival algorithms. They do classification, they do graph cl classification, network classification. And these are pretty influential papers published like in NIPS, in, in ICML, you know, these conferences, we do the comparison, okay. I will not give you the very detail, but you see this result. We, the major difference is we use heterogeneous, multi-typed network. They just trade everything just like a normal, a equal, they, they just are doing this. Now you probably can see the difference. These are three other algorithms. These are GNetMine. ACPT is author, conference, paper, and title. Okay, these four things form a network, but they don't do, they, we, we put the same network as input, but they don't do the classification or type, these four types, and we do it. Okay. Now you see the, the, the accuracy. This is how many percentage of author and how many percentage of paper you mark them. You see, these are some paper in database. This is the paper in machine learning. Okay. Then what you can see is you get 0.1% training data, and you want to do all the others as testing. Okay. Then you can see we can get 82%. Okay. They got it. It's only, you look at others, they won't get it that much. Okay. Especially, you think about this is 26% total for years. This is almost a random, random guess, right? You get 25% is a real random guess. Okay, so you get 0.5%, you can get, get pretty high. Okay. This is accuracy on authors. Remember, even authors themselves, it's, a, it's ambiguous, say, they're in which field. Like, for me, some people call me a database person, some people call me a data mining person. So it's a little ambiguous. Okay, so, and for papers, you get this. For conferences, you get a very high accuracy. You can see this. Because the conference usually the field is decided, okay? Uh, but paper sometimes is also ambiguous. These are the ranking results. That one is a clustering. This is ranking results. You can see database top ranked keywords are these, okay? This is data mining. This is AI. This is the information retrieval. So you, you can see you don't need to get a label. You actually will know them, okay? And these are top ranked database researchers data mining researchers, AI researchers, information. Actually, this ranking, to some extent, is pretty, a lot of people pretty recognize this, okay. And these are the, uh, are the conferences, okay. So it's a very good result. Remember, there's no real human being, but we did do have a little training. We took some 0.1%, you know, paper or, or, or you know, like uh, authors, okay. So, but you can see with training, actually, your result get even better than without training. You probably can see that. You just look at the names and the conferences, you probably see it's better. Okay. So with training, it's good. Then with this classification and clustering, what I want to say is also you can dig out a pretty hidden knowledge in the network we call role discovery. Okay. What are the role discovery? Okay. Suppose you give a network like this. Okay. Then if you really can do, suppose this is the army communication network. Okay, of course the army won't give us this data, right? So, but on the other hand, after you do this role discovery, you may form a little clean and neat network, hierarchical at different levels, okay? So then you maybe even, suppose you can even recognize who are the commanders, like the center one, these are the captains, these are the really foot soldiers, right? So at the end. So but you can see the network, so probably it's more useful than this one, right? Okay, so can we really do this? Of course you say, if we can do this automatically, just give me a network and can do that, it would be great, right? If you have intelligence, you probably see how the, ar the enemy army is structured. Okay, but we, we, do, we cannot do army, we don't even have data, but we do have DBRP, what we do is we say we extract semantic information from the links, we can of course, there are lots of tricky things you can see, but there are lots of attractive things you finally can get. Then, I will show you, we got a paper in this year's CKDD conference. 
the, the Chi Wang, he was my, actually he's my first year student, but he's very, very capable. I asked him to do this, and he did a marvelous work. He just say, we, with DBRP network, you know nothing about which university this guy is from. You may be able to identify who or who's advisor and advisee. Okay, that's pretty tricky. You think about this. But there is something you probably can know is advisor, advisee. If, if advisor and advisee never publish the paper together, there's no information we cannot get it. Okay, you have to publish paper together somehow. Okay, so but how can we get this? Okay, we actually uh, doing the major, major trick is you don't give too much knowledge. We will give some common sense knowledge as constraints you can get it. Why do not give too much knowledge? Because the, 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 the process, for example, in Stanford is very different from like a University of Munich or some university in England or in, in another, you know, Singapore or someplace. So you give it a rule, it may work in Stanford University or in the US, it doesn't work in Singapore. Okay. So then you get lots of errors. So the rule we finally put it this into network is very common sense rules. One rule says the advisor actually has a longer publication history okay, than the advisee at the time of supervision. Okay, that probably is, is true. Another thing we give is the advisee becomes an advisor, will not become an advisee again. Okay, so that means once you become a professor, you will not become a student again. Okay, so all this is true. Okay, maybe some some all ours. But anyway, we we use this common sense rule like this. Okay, very common. A every country will take it. Then we just do this basic constraint propagation. You just confine this, confine that, you finally can get it. Okay. So you can see we construct a network of the authors and papers and year. You, you do simplification, finally get things like this. Okay. The, the part we have is author paper, paper year, starting time, ending time, ranking score, using this. Of course, the highly ranked one, you see, this is number one professor could be candidate for the, or likely will be the advisor, and then their number two advisor. Actually, we do, sometimes we cannot make a decision, we give you two or three, okay, based on the ranking score. Okay. So, with this ranking score, we do this, we call time constraint probabilistic factor graph. Uh, remember, the time is critical. If you don't have a year, we cannot do it. Okay, you, you, you do have a year okay, in DBRP. So we take the starting, ending time, doing this, uh, this propagation. So you probably see the result actually is pretty respective because we checked uh, there's a massive ge 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 uh, geology project and AI geology project. They do have advisor advisee relationship. We do not use that for training, but we use this as a checking. Okay. Then, what you can see, I give you a few examples you probably know. Uh, one guy I did not put in actually is Joseph Hallerstein. Who was Joseph Hallerstein's advisor? Actually, we got two. We originally thought it was wrong because Joseph Hallerstein got a PhD in Wisconsin. The show two advisors is Mike Stonebreaker and Jeff Norton. We say Mike Stonebreaker cannot be. But actually, we checked in detail, Mike Stonebreaker was his master advisor. Another interesting thing is, even in their PhD committee, finally we found, Max Stonebreaker still served as a co-advisor on the committee. So that's the reason why we're actually right, right? So even he got a PhD in Wisconsin. And this one is my own student. He got two advisors, Chang Yang and Jia Wei Han. Actually, I know because Chang Yang was her master's thesis advisor. So to that extent, it's true. We took a search brand. He did not even got a PhD. But his advisor, that time at least, we do not know whether he finally claimed PhD or not, we are not certain, but the advisor is Rajiv Madwani, actually it's, it's true. Okay. So the, you, you, you got something pretty interesting. The accuracy is pretty good, and running time is reasonable. Okay. So that's about a raw discovery. Another interesting thing is with information network analysis, you can do data cleaning and data validation. Okay. I will show you. That this actually was done by Xiao Xin, it's here, okay. One interesting data cleaning work is object distinction. Uh, you know there's an object consolid uh, consolidation, essentially is you get different names, like, uh, you know, like uh, Bill Clinton, William Clinton, finally say, oh, that's the same person, okay. But object distinction is you got a way one, okay. There are 14 Wei Wangs. Actually, they carry the same last name, same 
first name in DBRP. And the object distinction is partitioning them into 14 slots automatically. So which paper belongs to who? Okay. So that's a really hard task, actually. When Xiaoxin first posed to me, I actually said, I said, it's almost impossible because I myself got three way ones, you know, co author at a different time. I, they all published in the same conference. Okay. So actually, there's another one Xiaoxin found is 72 songs and three albums carry the same name as Forgotten. Okay. So those are the very hard things to distinguish. But he finally did it. Okay. If you look at those things, the interesting thing is, he came back to me a few days later. Uh, I should mark this one as a little darker. But he told me, you know, it's not just the collaborations with the same author occasionally, but there are degrees of tight collaborations. Okay, you, for example, just Wei Wang. That's UNC Wei Wang. She actually collaborated with Zhong Yang and Dick Munz because she got a PhD in UCRA. Okay. But the other Wei Wang, like uh, he got a PhD under Hong Jun Lu, collaborating with Hong Jun Lu with Xue Ming, because later he joined Xue Ming's group. And there's a, another way one at, the, at, the, at the, uh, SUNY Buffalo, because uh, my student, Jian Pei, actually published papers. That's his student. But the problem is this Jian Pei actually working with this way one, also working with this way one. He worked with three or four different way ones. And uh, you know, at the same time, that's the reason you know, you know, makes things much, much muddier. But the problem, the interesting thing is what we call, the first thing is we use link-based similarity. Use a random walk. The random walk has a good thing is this. Okay. You will automatically judge which link is more important. You think about this. Okay. Is a conference link is more important or co-author link is more important? Actually, if you use a random walk, you will automatically say co-author probably carry more weights than co-conference. Because you publish one conference, Sigma may take, you know, 100 papers. Okay. Your you co-conference, same conference, doesn't mean that much. But you got only three or four author one paper, so they, they have tighter link. But another thing is who is going to train it? You got, like, we got a half a million authors. You, you, you dare not even to find a good training set. You know, Wei Wang, who is going to train Wei Wang? Okay. But the interesting thing is we said there are clean data in DBRP. We use self-training. What is self-training? Then within DBRP, okay, you will be able to find some kind of clean data. I just show you, for example, Johannes Gerg. Okay, there are not 14 Johannes Gergs in DBRP. Actually, it's only one. Okay, so why? Because the Gerg is not a very popular. Some people even have a hard time even pronounce it right. Okay, and Johannes, of course, in Germany maybe it's okay, but. Maybe here, overall in DBRP, is not that popular. It's not like John. But anyway, we took this. As, how to get this? You do a little you know, statistic thing. You get those other clean data. You take those clean data, run through this. You actually will get a parameters. You get a training, say, how sharp the knife should be to cut it. Okay. And with this, you, you, you know the parameter, you actually can training using SVM or something, you can get something pretty good. I'm going to, uh, another interesting thing is about a clustering. Remember to get a cluster, you can use single link, complete link, average link, and all of these. And finally, Xiaoxin found that using average link and refine it, okay, then you get a real good knife, you can cut it. Okay, I will show you just a few examples you probably can see. This example, there's a Joe Hellerstein, you probably know him, but there are quite a few Joe Hellerstains actually on there, but they actually not confusing each other because you, they have different mineral initial, okay? So we, we play the trick, we put a Joe Heller, two Joe Hellerstains, actually there are three. We all took their mineral initial out, we merged them together, see whether our system can do it, okay? Then to our surprise, actually the system any Joe Hellerson, they say I'm 100% sure the precision actually is 100%. It's right. But we do have some uh, record. Not everybody we can do the, we, we dare to say it's right. Okay. So the record is not 100%. But it's still a decent job. If you look at Wei Wang, you probably say Wei Wang is still not so good. Okay. Which is true because there are 40 of them. But we check Wei Wang one by one. We found actually it's not that bad. You think about this, 14 way ones, we got the 13 right, only this one was 
merged was eaten up by this way wall. Okay. But this way wall also suffered five papers to the UNC Chapel Hill way wall. But this UNC Chapel Hill one, she only suffered, she even suffered six to the Buffalo way wall. Okay, actually, these 11 papers were all muddied with Jan Pei, my previous student, because he collaborated with all the three at the same time, same conference, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's a, that's a, otherwise the accuracy should be higher, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just cannot do that. It's, some people ask, well, what about two way one? So author same paper, you know, I, I cannot do that. For sure. <laughs> then we look at another one is data validation. Okay. Data validation actually was also done by Xiao Xin. That's why Xiao Xin actually got a CKDD 2008 dissertation award. He got several great pieces of BCS work that data mining people really love it. Okay. So this one is about a truth validation. Is you get a network, you actually can consolidate truths. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the story was uh, Xiao Xing came back from one summer intern. It's not in Microsoft research, but he came back to me. He said some company people ask him to say, on the web, somebody is telling truth, some web page actually is, is, is lie. Okay. You get a conflict information. Can you write a program and say which one is right? Okay. That almost seems impossible to do it, right? But he came back, he said he wanted to think about this to do research. Uh, I originally also thought that this is very hard, you know, how, how could you get it? But then he worked out a very interesting method. I better show you the method instead of saying this. He actually really got a real data set containing such thing, which actually the non nice thing is it's structured, okay? The structure is much better than the natural language things. It's very, very, you know, fuzzy. Here you, you look at this. This is a book called Rapid Contextual Design. Okay. You probably do not know the book. I didn't, never read the book. Okay. But when Xiaoxin brings this book, look, check all these popular websites. Okay. To probably everybody's surprised, they all give different answers. Okay. Of course, a book only can have one right set of authors. Of course, you may say Barnes Noble is not doing too bad because the A1 book is the right answer. Barnes Noble only missed this middle name for the middle of the second author. Okay, it's not too bad. But there are some did it really bismal. Okay, it's really bad. But, but the problem is, if you cannot tr trust the Barnes Noble even, who you trust? Who, how could you get the right answer? Okay. So, Shashin worked out a very novel method, information network analysis. Okay, take this one as a game. Okay. You can think this is the real book. These are the websites who setting books, like uh, you know, Barnes Noble or you know, Powers book. These are what they stated, the authors. Okay. So you can see some actually have more dense connections, some have more sparse connection. Then you probably say, with this, just watch this network. Can I judge which one is more trustable? It looks almost impossible to think about it. Actually, if you really think about it, there are some rules you can get. Okay. Of course, one rule is assumption. This assumption can be extended. This one said there's only one true fact for a property. For the book, it's true. You know, it's only one true set of authors. Okay. But for some events, like a political events, you know, Democrats and the Republicans they debate, you even do not know which one is true. Okay. But something actually like Obama, you know, you say Obama is a present, which is true. But if you look at the time, uh, you know, time axis, you check the older web, see Obama was a senator of Illinois. Okay. Then he was a you know, Democrat candidate or president-elect or something. You get quite a few different titles. Which one is true? They are all true. They're true at different time slots. Okay. So we, we just assume there's one. We do not say there's an older web, or there's a newer web. Okay, we don't deal with this. Now, even something is a little more sure than the others. You look at Jennifer Widom and Jada Widom, you know, they sort of have a degree of the truth, but probably Jennifer Widom may be even more accurate. But these two actually become the critical one. Okay. This one says the false statement usually is more diverse. Okay, it's a little hard to converge, which is true. When you're telling mistakes, you make different mistakes. Okay? Uh, for example, you just assume that the, the, the police 
you know, catch three robbers, robber a bank. Okay. The police definitely not say we have a panel discussion. Okay. What they do is they isolate those thieves. Okay. They question one by one. Why they isolate them? Just because they know when they want to tell a lie, likely they tell some different versions. They won't converge. Okay. When they're telling truth, likely they could be converged. Okay. That's a golden rule for us. Another one, of course, is the trustability. If the website keep telling you the truth, you say, oh, this website, I probably trust more. Otherwise, if you keep telling lies, I probably ignore you. Okay. So with this, you can build a truth or confidence propagation game. This game is somewhat like a HITS algorithm, or you think HITS, you have you know, hubs and authority pages you can turn around, propagate. This one, we can do it. Okay. For example, you can think there are hubs, there are authority. Okay. At the very beginning, you may say the websites and facts, I don't know which one is more trustable, they are equal. Okay. But then, even they are equal. Okay. Once you build this network, they become unequal again. Why? You look at this. This is O2, it's a book. There are three guys said this should be this author. There's one guy said you should be author F4. Okay. Based on the rule, if you do not know anything, you probably say this one likely will be true, this one likely will be the false. Okay. And if this one is true, maybe this guy telling this F1 may be a little truer than you know, W2 because W2 already made mistakes. So you do this, you start propagating. Okay. Of course, with a massive, you get a tiny network, you not work. With massive network, like the Google can play the game because it's massive. Okay. So that's, finally you can make it work. Okay. Of course, this game, the difference is uh, they are, you know, the computation is not additive. It's propagation, probability, you know, those kind of computation, uh, confidence computation, you use different formulas. Actually, Shashin really did this one. You see this is a truth finder competing with Barnes Noble. Okay. Why pick up Barnes Noble? Barnes Noble, Google rank number one. Okay. You, if you can beat number one, you can beat many people. Okay. So, and if you look at Xiaoxin, he got this, uh, these many books from Abe.com. He randomly pick 100 books and judge whether it's good or not. And we'll see almost every entry, okay. The truth finder coded by Xiaoxin, uh, he can do better or no worse comparing to Barnes Noble. Okay, so, but actually it's not, not because Xiaoxin is magic. Xiaoxin takes many websites of wit, including Barnes Noble itself. But finally, he can beat Barnes Noble. Okay. So actually, he even did this, is try to see which bookstore is more trustable. And Google rank Barnes Noble number one, and Powers Book number three. But actually, the truth, trustworthiness-wise, these three, three no-name bookstores actually ranked pretty high. But come on with a name like that, the same bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. They probably only publish something on religions, I do not know. <laughs> but uh, they publish less, but they do a better job, right? <laughs> but uh, Power's book, I think they should uh, blame their data input, or they really got a pretty abysmal you know, ranking. This one is about data validation using network. And another thing is using network, you can do search. You can do similarity search. OK, I will just show you the very last one. Remember, people doing similarity search, you say, how similar VRDB versus SIGMOD? If you, you just ask people, of course, they know it, but you ask DBRP, it's hard to say because their added distance is very long, okay, very big. And for example, if I ask you, you know, who is most similar to Christophalusus? That's also a tough, tough question. And we did it and did it very high quality. The, trace, the trick is we use information network but the question actually is much harder to answer in the sense, even for human being. You ask who is most uh, similar to Christopher Falusos? You could say, I don't know, it depends on which standard. It's similar is just because they have tight connection by co-authoring, or they attend the same conference or publish in the same conferences, or they exactly work on the same topics. Okay. So actually, these different things, by network, you can use past sch schema. Okay. What is past schema? Look at this. This is paper, this is author, this term, this conference. 
if you want to say who is most similar to Christos Philosos, you can go to paper, back to the author, what do you got most similar one, Eric's co-authors. But if you go from author paper to conference, the most similar ones is they publish in a similar set of conferences. But if you go through author paper to term, what you got is they work on exact same topic, even they may not even publish in the same conference, okay, using the same terms. So you, you, you first see, we took Chris follows as a query, okay. This APA means author, paper, author. Who you got it? You see, Spiros, Papadimito, G. Mingson, you know, Pan, you know. Most of these are his students, including Yuri Leskovic. Actually, I think Flip Korn is also his student, was his student. You can check back. I, I, I am not 100% sure. But anyway, you, uh, this similarity, it could be co-authors because similarity is lower. But anyway, these are author, paper, author. But if you go to author, paper, conference, paper, author, you go through the conference, you can see the most similar ones me. The reason is I publish both in database and data mining conference. He does the same way, right? So, and Rakesh Agar also, right? But if you look at uh, exactly terms, actually Jian Pei or Srini, Jeffrey, actually uh, Ming, Ming Xian Chen, actually higher than me. Because I even published in the same conference, I work on different things. I published like associate rules. He said, no, no, I will forget that. He will do different things. That's the reason, okay, you get different things. So that's very telling if you think of this. Based on many, many papers, many, many titles, this network, big network in terror, something very smart. We even tried on Flickr, okay? You can see we take this flower, this lotus flower as the query, number one. The most similar is to itself, of course. Then we want to find the most similar pictures using tags, okay? But if you use tag image user, you use tag image tag using this way, you, that, that's why we say ITI, image tag image. You just look at this, you say this is okay, but not that good because this bird is not lotus flower, okay? But if you use image, image uh, tag image group, going back, this group tag actually is quite telling. Now go through group tag, you see those are all lotus flower. Even this flower is not blossom yet. Okay, these are still lotus flower, okay? So you actually can see it's very telling. So that's a nice thing. You, you see the similarity search using network. Actually you can get sigma to VRDB is much similar than say sigma to with KDD or sigma to with triple A. Okay, that, even sigma to with sig graph, they all carry sig, but it's still pretty far apart, okay? So we actually can, give you a conference, say, which conference is most similar, okay? I give you a DAS file. We don't give you a sigma, because sigma automatically you cannot tell. We give you a DAS file, say, who is most sigma, uh, similar to DAS file? You use the page rank, personalized page rank. You got a DAS file, it's ICDE, VRDB, sigma, DEXAS. Reason is DAS file is working in database. They put the higher ones, highly ranked one will put it high. Actually, DAS file is not that highly ranked. So they are not similar to sigma. You would not agree it's most similar to sigma. So, but if you use our CPAPC, based on the authors, remember sigma author may not always want to send papers to DASPA. So what you got is that, uh, DASPA is most similar to DEXA, WIME, APYP, CIKM. You know, that's definitely telling, right? You think about this, you get levels of conference clearly, rather than you just, uh, Take highly ranked one, give it to him, okay? So this similarity actually using massive network is very, very telling, okay? So the similar thing we use, we competing with sim rank. The interesting thing is sim rank going way, way, way far ahead to fetch neighbors. What do you fetch? After many iterations, we run many iterations. You got sigma, the most similar is foundation trends. They have HPTC, of course, they have CIDR, but they have something actually is pretty strange. But here we got, you can see Sigma the most similar to this conferences or journals. So this one, ten, sim rank, even they are expensive, they tend to grab a little remote neighbors. 
And here we follow this path, you can actually tell quite truth. Okay. So that's why this similarity function for, for, for our new uh, measure actually is very good. Okay, now I finally finished the whole thing. Of course, we got lots of students doing, did a lot of things. There are other things I did not tell, but these things all relate to information networks. But I think it's very exciting in a sense. The information network, especially hooked with database, we call DB InfoNet, actually can give the database a new life. Because remember, we just take DBRP or a Flickr or something. As an example, DBRP is structured. Okay. With this structured network, you do far better than the web. Okay. Remember, people, database people were bullied by the web people, say, oh, we can do more things. Actually, database people can do many, many more things because database hold the real assets of data and it is structured. Okay. With the structure the database, you will do far better than many, many people working in AI or IR. Okay. That's why I say the database linking team up with information network, you will get a new knowledge base. And it's very powerful knowledge base. Okay. So that's, I finished my talk. So these are the recent papers, including Xiaoxin's several papers. These are all this year's paper. And uh, of course, now we publish most in KDD, Sigma, we argue that tutorial. And we also publish in WW conference. But there's one on DASFA, OK? <laughs> 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 OK, so, so thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, the, re the reason we got DASFA is DASFA this year is in Japan. I really want to go there. <laughs> yes? In uh, the truth uh, discovery uh, work that you described, uh, do you consider the, the fact that some websites are copying information from each other? Yeah, very, very good point. Xiaoxin's original one consider a little. But uh, the copycat effects is is very tricky thing. Uh, I do have a student working on this copycat problem. Actually, last year, Luna Dong, uh, he is in AT&T Research now. Uh, she, she published two papers in VRDB. Actually, two papers, both sides, Xiaoxin's paper, actually did a follow-up work. It did really good. I enjoy reading that two papers. Uh, we are still working on it. I think it's a very good problem on this shoes one. The copycat effect definitely is a very interesting one and also a very tricky one. Yeah, it's a very good point. Okay. Yeah, thank you much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.